1989 winter Usenics in San Diego, so it was 25 years ago uh, that we did the, uh, we had the conversation about the, the talks about the internet worm, the Morris worm. And uh, it was Usenix, I was talking with Rick earlier today who's been around Usenix for a while and you know, that was, there was the Usenix conference. There was one of them. There weren't, there, you, know, you know, security hadn't been peeled off and the file system piece hadn't been peeled off and whatever, so it was one big conference. So like Kevin said, um, I've been for the last several years writing a book called Exploding the Phone, which is a history of phone hacking, a history of phone hackers. And I was always sort of interested in these people who, before there were computers, before there were, you know, before computers were commonplace, before the internet, certainly, you know, who were the people who thought it would be an interesting idea to start hacking around with the telephone system? And what motivated them? And what can we learn from them? And so that's what my book has been about. And as uh, Kevin mentioned, I spent a, a lot of my research was done with interviews, but a lot of it was also with Freedom of Information Act requests or FOIA requests. And uh, I, I was actually kind of surprised. I, I ended up filing about 500 requests with the FBI and a bunch of other three-letter organizations with the government. And then later, uh, somebody else, uh, I think it was Jason Leopold, filed a FOIA request with the FBI saying, hey, do you have a list of, uh, of troublesome requesters, right? Who are the people that you hate? And I was honored to be on that, so. <laughs> um, so in order to, for this, so what I'd like to do in my talk today is I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the telephone network, kind of how it worked, and then talk about the vulnerabilities, and then try and relate those vulnerabilities, and this is, you know, this is ancient history, this is from 50 years ago. Try and relate that to where we are today and what are kind of the enduring lessons. In order for this to make any sense at all, I need for you to get in the Wayback Machine with me. Um, I'm going to ask you, we're going we're gonna to move around on the dial on the Wayback Machine a little bit. It's going to go sometimes as far back as 1920 or 30, and then maybe up into the 1950s and 1960s. Think of a time when, back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, in the United States, there was really only one phone company. It was a government regulated monopoly. It was American Telephone and Telegraph, or AT&T. Uh, it was also known as the Bell System. So it was, there were a few other independent companies, but AT&T had you know, 90 plus percent of the market. And so it was, it was the monopoly that made the telephone system work. And it was, it was serious about being a monopoly. You couldn't own your own phone. So imagine a world where your phones are not printed, but actually stamped in steel on the bottom of the phone, Bell system property, not for sale, right? Just to remind you, this isn't your phone. This is our phone, it's our network, it's our system, right? It's a very, very different world than we live in today. Imagine, too, a world in which long distance phone calls are actually expensive. This is a graph uh, of the cost of a five minute phone call from New York to San Francisco during the day, for those of you who are old enough, you'll remember the phone company used to have daytime, evening, and nighttime rates. Um, this is expressed in constant dollars. And I'd like to address your attention to the upper left-hand corner of that graph, right? Yikes, right? Imagine a five-minute phone call costing 25 or $30, something like that, right? So this was a time when phone calls were actually expensive. Again, very different than today, right? Today, we all have you know, all-you-can-eat cell phone long distance plans rolled into your monthly bill. If you're cheaper than that, you can use Skype for free. My understanding is that Google right now is working on a program where if you will listen to advertisements during your phone calls, they will pay you to make calls. You know, so you know, it's, again, very different world. And then, then there's this. This is one of the three pieces of high technology in the average American home, let's say in the 1950s or 60s, right? The, the three pieces were a radio, a television set, and a black rotary telephone. Telephones came in, at the time, one color, black rotary. And for the average person, this was something that in the words of one guy I interviewed from my book, he said, the telephone was not something that was interesting enough to be interested in at all. It's just, it's a utilitarian thing. You pick it up, it makes phone calls, it's not that sexy, whatever. It's a phone, right? But if you have a certain, let's call it a mental feature, not a bug, um, you look at this and you think like, this is a black box. How does it work? How, how, does, how does this whole thing work? You know, I can, I can dial phone calls with it. It has these wires that run into the wall and then the wires go up into the telephone pole. But there's no documentation about how it works. 
and you gotta, it becomes sort of this, this lightning rod for curiosity, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Now, back in the 1950s, or 40s, 50s, 60s, if you were making a local call, you used, you dialed on your rotary phone, this is right, for, for those of you who, who've grown up with touch tones, the word dial doesn't make sense, but there's a dial on that phone, right? And what your dial pulses were doing was controlling a piece of switching equipment called a step-by-step -step or a Stroger switch. This is um, this awesome piece of mechanical clockwork. Um, that's called, those are, you're seeing four Stroger cans on that graphic. Um, two of them have the dust protectors on, two of them on the outside have the dust protectors off, so you can see all the innards. And when you would dial a seven on your rotary phone, the phone would make and break uh, an electrical connection on your phone line, so you'd actually get pulses. And your phone was actually the thing that was controlling the electromechanical switching in there, causing a switch there to go tack, 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 from one position over seven. And then the next, after there was a pause where you're dialing your next digit, the thing would connect to that switch, and now your next digit would control the next Stroger can in sequence. So this was a direct control system. There was no centralized intelligence. The dial on your phone is actually controlling equipment in the central office. These things worked remarkably well. Um, they managed to make you know, phone calls locally. Um, they were kind of slow, and eventually they got replaced by something called a crossbar switch. So this is, again, electromechanical. This is kind of 1930s, 1940s, 1950s vintage, uh, where you're using, it's an XY system, and when you dial numbers, it makes a connection between the two, and that stacks to your next switch in turn. So that was pretty cool. The phone company had figured out how to automate local calls. But long distance was still the preserve of human beings. And long distance operators, and back before about 1970, all telephone operators were women. Actually, that's not true. Uh, in, when the phone company first started in the 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, they thought that teenage boys would make excellent telephone operators because they thought that the teenage boys would have the quick reflexes necessary to connect, you know, put plugs into jacks. What they rapidly found out was that teenage boys are foul-mouthed jokers, and so that's really not a good thing. Um, so they replaced them with women, um, and that worked better. So say that you want to make a long-distance call from, you know, San Diego to New York. The way this would work in the old days would be you would pick up your phone, you'd dial the operator, you'd talk to your local operator, and you'd say, I want to make a long distance call. She would connect you to a long distance operator who's sitting at this, uh, what's called a cord board, just like in the you know, old movies, and she's got this field of jacks which are analog trunk lines. So these are actual wires or in some cases microwave or coaxial cable links to other cities, and they're labeled, you can't see there, but you know, say like Chicago 1, Chicago 2 for different trunk lines. And you'd say, I want to call my friend in New York, his number is whatever, and she's like, okay, well, let's see, my two trunk lines that I have to New York are busy, but that's okay, I can do alternate routing, right? And so I'm gonna plug into Chicago, and I'm gonna talk to another uh, operator in Chicago, and explain that we wanna call New York, and the Chicago operator will do the same thing to the New York operator, and the New York operator will eventually call. So what you have here is circuit switching, literally circuit switching, with human beings as effectively IP routers, except without packets, right? I mean, you know, this is using human brains to, to solve this routing problem. And it's a, it's a tough problem. If you want to make long distance work, this is a hard problem. You have to be able to route from any city in the United States to any other city, right? So you have to be smart enough to figure out how am I going to get there. You need to be able to do fallback routing in case the circuits are busy. Um, you need to be able to then keep track of when the call was made and, and how long it lasted so you can bill for it, right? And this is all problems that are solved by human intelligence, right? So you have operators who are actually solving this problem. So that's great, but the phone company realized it had a problem, which was um, it's, it was essentially going to be a victim of its own success. In the 1950s, the phone company employed about 100,000 operators. So imagine that, 100,000 human beings putting plugs into jacks to make phone calls. They looked at the, at the graphs and they said, okay, by 1970, we're gonna need a million operators to make this thing work. And there's two problems with that number. The first problem is that we can't afford that, right? We would just, you know, the phone company would go bankrupt if it had to pay a, pay a million people. The second problem is, again, remember, these are women, and in the phone company's mind, only, only women can be operators. There weren't simply a million women in the workforce in 1970. So this isn't going to work. 
So starting as early as the 1940s, they worked on automating long distance. So just like we automated local dialing, we're gonna build a machine which will be able to solve these problems. What does this machine look like? It was the magnificently named 4A toll crossbar. Um, one of the things that you learn is that when you're a government monopoly, you don't need fancy product names, right? So you don't need the Whizbang 2000, it's simply the 4A toll crossbar, of course, what else? Um, so in this photo, uh, for scale, that is a human being uh, standing there in this machine. And the, the terrifying thing about this is this is only a portion of the machine. Um, this is, uh, the, the complete 4A toll crossbar would take up about one city block. And the phone company ended up uh, building about 175 of these across the United States between roughly 1940 and I think the last one was installed in 1976. Um, it was using a uh, crossbar. Uh, for the actual electrical interconnect. It was using vacuum tubes and relays for the control logic. And this was a thing that could actually solve this problem of making long distance calls. So we talked before about uh, you know, human beings routing calls from one place in the US to the other. Um, the way the machine would do this, of course, if you were building it today, right, you'd be like, well, that's no problem. I mean, first off, it could probably fit in, you know, 64K bytes or something, right? It's just not that big of a routing table, and it's static. But, you know, let's say we're gonna get fancy and we're gonna have a little SQL database or something. This is what a SQL database looked like in 1943 in Philadelphia. Um, it's a metal punch card. And what happens is it has to be metal for durability. You can't just use a standard paper punch card. And what happens is based on the first six digits of a telephone number that you're dialing, uh, a machine called a card translator, which was about the size of maybe two dishwashers or washing machines end to end, um, would use an electromagnet to select the appropriate card translator card. And then you can see that there are different size holes punched there. Light would shine through the holes, um, determine whether the hole has been punched or not, and from that would decide how to do routing for your call and you could program in backup routes and things like this, and then once it was done, the electromagnetics would release it, and the card would drop, and it would go on to do the next call. Um, if you needed to change your network, it was as simple as mailing out a new set of metal cards to all of the 175 uh, 4A12 crossbars, and that could, could reroute your network. Uh, I talked to a guy who used to work in one of these machines, and he said, uh, well, we'd have a room that had six of these card translators, and he said, they were so noisy that we had to wear hearing protection if we were gonna be in the room because of the sounds of these steel cards being lifted and dropped constantly, hundreds of times a minute. So they made this machine, this 4A toll crossbar. Um, it had to be able to do routing. It had to be able to talk to uh, the other 4A toll crossbars and communicate with them. And I'm gonna let the phone company tell you about it in its own words. This is um, a little snippet from a promotional, I was gonna say video, but no, a promotional film um, from the 1950s. And this is celebrating uh, and announcing the pilot of what was called direct distance dialing, where people would be able to dial long distance calls themselves going through these machines. And this was in Englewood, New Jersey. Should we get audio? Uh, oh, <laughs> we have a uh, we have a, a electromechanical problem here, not a software problem. Let's plug that in; it'll work better. <clears throat> All right. One of hundreds of American communities, population twenty-five thousand, main street with busy stores, banks, and movie theaters. Attractive suburban homes with their neat lawns and their well-groomed look. In size and in the kind of people who live here, Englewood is like many other American towns. And that was one of the reasons it has become the first town in the world to have an unusual kind of telephone service. Remember that number Mrs. Warren looked up in her personal telephone notebook? 318 Garfield 5 Two three six eight. The only difference between that and a local number is the three digits at the beginning. 318 is the code for the San Francisco area. If her daughter had lived in Chicago, Mrs. Warren would have dialed the code 312 and then the telephone number. Cleveland, 216. Boston, 617. 
Altogether, more than 80 numbered areas are planned for the United States and parts of Canada. For some time past, area numbers like these have been used by telephone operators in dialing long-distance calls. When the people in the Englewood area, with one and two party lines, were given this service, they could dial to 13 of these areas. That meant that more than 11 million telephones could be dialed from Englewood. Keeping track of the details of the call is done automatically too. When you dial a number, holes are punched in a continuous tape representing your telephone number and the number you dial. More holes are punched to show the time when you start talking and when you finish talking and hang up. If you get a busy signal or the number doesn't answer, no charge is made. Since all this information is in the form of tiny holes in a long piece of paper, the meaning of these tiny holes has to be expressed in words and figures. This is done by running the tape through several machines which assemble the information, translate, sort and summarize it, figure the length of your call, apply the correct rate, and, you guessed it, type your toll statement. I'm always amazed by this video every time I watch it, right? Imagine that if somebody tells you and says, hey, I need you to go out and build a reliable long distance network where you can have conversations with people, where we'll have, you know, not too many calls get dropped. We need to be able to do billing and all this stuff. And by the way, the only tools you have are stone knives and bear skins, right? <laughs> um, you know, it, it's incredible, right? Holes in paper tape, that's your billing mechanism, really? Like, and, and the answer is yes, really, right? This is what these guys had to work with, and that's what Bell Labs and the phone company made work, and they built the most reliable and most advanced telephone system in the world. And so it's, um, so the, you know, a couple things that come to my mind about this, right? One is it's fun to kind of laugh at that. The second thing is remember that at some point, probably at, you know, the Usenix Security 2114 conference, somebody is going to be laughing at every single thing you guys are doing. Right? <laughs> so, oh my God, they used IP version 4. Can you believe it? Um, yeah, right, exactly, right. They're probably still going to be on IP version 4. <laughs> oh, what am I thinking? Of course. Um, anyhow, so uh, let's, let's go back then to, um, to, to how this all worked. So they built this, this amazing 4A toll crossbar machine. Now, back in the day, when you dialed a long distance call using one of these 4A toll crossbars, you would sometimes in the background hear something that sounded like this. Anybody remember hearing those? Those are not touch tones, by the way. Okay, a few of you. So those were internal telephone company tones that were how the 4A toll crossbar switches communicated with one another. Um, and so let's, let's just go through the details on this real quick. Say that you want to make a call from San Diego to New York. San Diego is on the left. It has a palm tree. Um, and, uh, and so you've got a phone in San Diego, a phone in New York, and you've got two telephone company 4A buildings that are taking up the city block. And uh, there are trunk lines, these analog trunk lines that are between the, the New York and San Diego in this case. And when the trunk lines are idle, when nothing is happening, they have 2,600 hertz on them. It's just the idle line marker. And 2,600 hertz sounds like this just a tone. And that's how New York and San Diego know that a given line is idle. Now, if in San Diego you pick up the phone and you dial a number, what happens is San Diego finds an idle trunk to New York and it removes 2600 hertz. So New York hears that trunk line go idle and says, ah, San Diego is about to send me some digits because it's going to tell me what number I want to call. And so San Di uh, sorry, New York attaches a, a receiver, a register to it, so it can start decoding digits that, that San Diego is going to send. And then um, either, uh, either San Diego is going to send MF tones like this, or it's just going to send beeps of 2600 hertz. It turns out MF tones were the advanced system. The original system was if you wanted to dial 212, you would just use little pulses of 2600 hertz, so it would sound like beep, 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 so 212, and go on from there. So New York then connects to the telephone that you want to call, and 
uh, it removes 2600 hertz in the back direction, and that tells San Diego, aha, the remote telephone answered. I can start billing for this call, because the originating central office is responsible for billing. And you have your conversation, which is great. And then at the end, San Diego hangs up. San Diego puts 2600 hertz back on the line, and that tells New York, oh, OK, San Diego hung up. And so then uh, New York responds, putting 2600 hertz in the backwards direction. That completes the whole conversation. We're back to the, to the start, right? So that makes sense. There's this whole kind of handshaky thing in terms of how we set up a phone call. So that's great. Um, the only problem is um, people like Joe Ingressia. Um, Joe Ingressia was uh, a kid who was born about 1949 or so. I was born blind. Um, always really interested in technology, always really interested in the telephone. Spent a lot of time hanging out on the telephone. Um, his parents fought a lot. The telephone was kind of a, a safe refuge for him. And he would just spend time listening to the, to the phone. And here's when I interviewed him, something he said. This was probably in like 57 or 58. And I was, I don't know how I happened to be on a long distance. I think we had made a long distance call. And I heard this you know, kind of found in the background. And um, so I kind of whistled along with it, and it cut the line off. And I was, it made a click and cut it off, and um, I didn't know why. And then I dialed, um, had the operator, I could have her connect me with information, and that was free back then. And I would whistle that tone, and it would make the line click. And if it was talking, I would cut it off, you know. So young eight-year-old Joe Ingressia had figured out that if you whistled 2,600 hertz, you could cause a, a phone call in progress to hang up, right? And if you go back to this slide, you can see why, right? Because as soon as the remote end hears 2,600 hertz, it thinks that you know, the, the originating end has ended the call, and so everything goes, goes away. Um, and so really what you have there, it turns out, is uh, he, that was when he was eight years old, he figured this out. By 10 years old, he had figured out that this was a really fun denial of service attack. Because what you could do is you could go to some place where it had a lot of pay phones. He said an airport was a really good place for this. Um, and then you wait until you hear a bunch of people on phones on long distance calls, and then you just whistle 2600 hertz really loud, and it resets all of their calls, right? <laughs> But by the time Joe was about 18, and he was in, this would be 1968, he was in college at the University of Southern Florida, um, he had figured out that there was more you could do if you were good at whistling, which he was. So this is him being interviewed on the NBC Evening News. If you had perfect pitch like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. Let's see if I make it this time. This is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing about now. Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while. He even it. showed off his skills for the local media. From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand-mile phone call by whistling. Okay, so we got Joe. Joe's pretty good at whistling, right? He can He can do like that, and be able to make pulses of 2600 hertz, and now he can whistle calls through the network. Now it turns out, the interesting thing, and the security problem here, well, one of the many security problems here, is that uh, billing is done on the originating end. So when he's whistling this, he's talking to the far end. He's talking to, in our example, New York. But as far as the San Diego switch, in this case, is concerned, um, as far as it's concerned, it's still billing him for whatever the original call was. Right? It doesn't even know that he sent 2,600 hertz down the line and hung up. So if he was calling, say, an 800 number, or if he was calling directory assistance, his initial call is free, so it's not being billed at all. And then he can basically hijack the call and reroute it anywhere he wants. Okay? So put yourself now in the shoes of an AT&T executive. You have just spent, oh, let's say, two, three billion dollars um, from 1940s into the 50s and 60s, building out this network of these fantastically complicated machines, only to find out that this blind kid can whistle free phone calls and defeat your entire revenue generating apparatus. This is not your best day. Um, however, you can console yourself that, you know, even as Joe Ingressia himself says, 
this is really hard to do, right? I mean, he's spent a lot of his life at this point kind of perfecting his whistling ability, and there aren't a lot of people who do that. So that's awesome, and that's good, and so you can sleep a little bit better that night, until it turns out that there are clever college students who are electrical engineers who can build tone generators, <laughs> right? And these things become known as blue boxes because the first one that the phone company uh, confiscated was in a blue metal cabinet. This was in 1961. So there are two of them here. Um, the one on the left was uh, a, a single frequency box. So it, it exactly emulates what Joe Ingressio was doing, which is it has a 2600 hertz generator in it. And if you dial a 7, it makes seven blips of 2600 hertz. So just like Joe whistling, except you don't have to whistle. Um, the one on the right is a more fancy one. It actually has the multi-frequency tones, so it can actually generate uh, those little quick tones that you heard that sound a little bit like touch tones. And this becomes, you know, starting around 1961, 62, you start seeing these things cropping up, and the phone company is now slowly starting to get worried about it. Again, though, if you're an AT&T executive, yeah, okay, this is, again, still not our best day, but there aren't that many blind whistling kids, and there aren't that many people who are able to build electronic tone generators. To really have a bad day requires the Quaker Oats Company. Um, the Quaker Oats Company had a box of cereal called Captain Crunch. And they started giving away these little freebies in boxes of Captain Crunch called the Captain Crunch Bosun Whistles. It was starting around 1965. And this is just a little plastic whistle, a little plastic doodad. And if you uh, cover up one of the holes and you blow it, you get a perfect 2600 hertz tone. So now every person who has Captain Crunch cereal is a potential phone hacker, right? So now it's really not a good day. So what are you going to do about this? Well, one of the problems is, if you're the phone company, you go to your buddies at the FBI, because the phone company and the FBI have been like this for a long time. And, uh, and you say, we, we, we got this horrible thing, right? We built this network, and it has this gaping hole in it, and we, we got to fix this. And it's awesome. Uh, I don't have a copy of the memo here, but there's this great, there's this great FBI or Department of Justice memo saying, um, yeah, you know, the AT&T guys were here, and they would really like it if we would start prosecuting um, this problem. But really, it seems to us like that would just basically make us their collection agency for a problem that they created. We're not really enthusiastic about that. So they told the phone company, sorry, we're not going to help you with this. You, you got, you know, you're going to have to deal with this yourself. So the phone company went off and was starting to think about, well, what are we going to do? But it turns out, in addition to the, to the blind kids and the uh, electrical engineering students, there was another group that was really interested in this technology. And that was organized crime. Um, this is a photo from the 1940s of a bookie, uh, a, a layoff bookmaker. Um, so it turns out that organized crime got a giant amount of money from uh, running organized crime bookmaking operations, right? Sports betting for the most part. And if you were a bookie in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, your, the telephone was your lifeline. And it, for two reasons. One is the telephone was how you talked to your customers, right? That's how people place bets. But it was also how you stayed in touch with, you know, Atlantic City and Las Vegas to get these, what was called the sports betting line, basically the point spread by how many, you know, if, if there's a Packers game this weekend or, you know, they're expected to win by seven points. Okay, great. That tells you how to, how your bets are going to get placed. Um, so these guys were on the phone constantly. And the Department of Justice, starting in the 1960s, really wanted to go after organized crime. And they said, we're going to take down the, the bookmaking operation because that is an incredibly lucrative operation for organized crime. The way they started doing this was uh, by looking at the pattern of phone calls. So this will be familiar to some of you, thanks to, thanks to uh, the Snowden revelations. Um, it may not be legal for the FBI or the Department of Justice to wiretap bookmakers, but it was certainly legal for them to get what we would now call telephony metadata, right? Call detail records. And so if they think that Phil Laps is a bookmaker, they can either subpoena or more likely just pick up the phone and call their buddy at the phone company and say, hey, would you give me Phil Lapsley's toll records, please? I want to see who this Lapsley guy calls. OK, he calls Kevin Fu, you know, a well-known bookmaker. And, uh, and so they can start to piece together this network diagram. So, the bookies were super excited about this phone freak technology, these blue boxes and another thing called a black box, because, for two reasons. One is it made the phone calls free, right? Remember that graph I showed you of $25 for a five-minute call, right? So just from a profit and loss perspective, the bookies like the idea of free phone calls. But better still, it makes the calls invisible. 
calls that you make with a blue box don't show up on the telephone company's billing system, which means that the FBI can't get any information when it looks at the phone call records. But this turned out to be just the thing that AT&T needed, because now AT&T gets to go back to the Justice Department and say, hey, knock, knock, um, you know you didn't want to be our revenue collection agency before. What if we were to help you get organized crime bookmakers? Because it turns out they're using these blue boxes, and suddenly the Justice Department's like, huh, blue boxes, they're bad. We need to prosecute these things, right? We, we really need to go after these guys. So there were a couple more. Um, this phone freaking, one of the things that I found really interesting about it is it kind of morphed from one thing to another, right? So it starts off with just curious hobbyists. Then organized crime gets a hold of it. Then you can't really quite see this so well, but the yippies, right? The hippie yippie movement gets a hold of it. This is the Youth International Party line, which is a really bad telephone pun. It's the Youth International Party plus telephone party lines. Um, this is their newsletter. And this was in May of 1971. And this was this thing that said, hey, we want to take phone freak technology for making free phone calls, and we want to distribute it to the hippies and yippies so you guys can make free phone calls. Well, why do you want to do that? Well, one, of course, because you know, in your mind, in your hippie mind, AT&T is this big giant monopoly, and we need to rip them off. But there's a, there's a really good moral rationale for why we should do this. And that is the US government has a 10% tax on long distance phone calls. And that tax brought in about a billion dollars a year in 1971. And that was used to fund the Vietnam War. So by making free phone calls, you can deprive the government of the revenues it needs to send young men off to fight and die in Southeast Asia so you can feel good about it. Isn't that awesome? Right? And so this, is, this becomes this whole countercultural hijacking of, uh, of phone freak technology for you know, making free phone calls. Um, you then started to have a group of people uh, who just started getting into this for hobby kind of purposes. These are, this is John Draper, uh, is on the right hand side there. Uh, his alias was Captain Crunch, uh, and a couple of other phone freaks. There were a group of people, maybe 50 or 100 across the United States, who just loved to go out and play with the telephone network. They wanted to just see how does the telephone network work. Here, these guys are uh, at a, um, in Duval, Washington, and they've gone out to this little town in Washington to make a phone call. You can see, I think, yeah, they're holding a blue box there. They just want to see how does the network work from that particular point in the network, right? They're just playing around with the network. So you've got the yippies, you've got the hobbyists, you've got organized crime. And then in 1971, you have Esquire magazine. Esquire magazine has a circulation of 500,000 people. And it wrote, uh, the guy named Ron Rosenbaum in Esquire wrote an article called Secrets of the Little Blue Box. And this is this amazing article. You can find a copy of it on the web, and you ought to check it out, because the writing is fantastic. It takes what is, let us face it, the geekiest hobby in the world, right? And makes it seem like a cross between James Bond and Alice in Wonderland and an acid trip. It takes, it takes this phone freak thing and just makes it incredibly interesting. And now suddenly 500,000 people are reading this. And it turns out the article was written in such a way that it, 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 when you first read it, it seems like it's fiction. But if you have a certain kind of technical bent, you realize like there's enough technical detail in here that, um, that you, can, you can see that there's something true about this. It's not, just, it's not just fiction. It actually is true. Two of the people who had that technical bent were Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Uh, so in... Uh, that in the next, I think it was uh, December of 71, uh, Steve Wozniak was at his mom's house and was happened to be reading the Esquire article. And he's like, wow, there's this fantastic article. It's really cool. It's about people like me, people who like to hack on stuff. And then he, he got halfway through the article and he realized, oh my god, this is true. It's not fiction. And he called Steve Jobs, who was then in high school, and he said, we've got to figure out how to do this. And so they uh, drove down to the Stanford Linear Accelerator to route through the library to find uh, some technical journals that would actually have the frequencies they needed to make blue boxes. Uh, and before long, they had managed to make a blue box. And their first entrepreneurial venture together before Apple computers was selling blue boxes door to door in the dorms at UC Berkeley. Um, this is actually, so that's a photo of Waz. Uh, that's a map of the Berkeley campus behind him. That's a, a blue box that he has in his hand. And there's the inset is Steve Jobs admiring their first product. They figured they sold about, uh, I think they said about 160 of these boxes. Uh, their sales technique was pretty clever because, um, you know, this is an illegal thing, right? Um, what Wozniak said he would do is he would go, he would just knock on a random dorm room door. 
and be like, hey, I want to talk to, to Steve. And the person would be like, there's no Steve here. And you say, Steve, you know, the guy, the guy who has blue boxes. And the person would be like, no, what's a blue box? What are you talking about? Oh, it's this thing that allows you to make a free phone call. And depending on what the person's reaction was, he would know if he had a good sales prospect, right? So if the person's like, free phone calls, that sounds cool. What is it? Well, I have one here, you know. Um, so, uh, so this is how Wozniak and Jobs got their start. And there's actually a, a quote from Steve Jobs in a, in a history interview. Uh, he said, without blue boxes, there never would have been an Apple computer. Both Woz and Jobs felt like it was this entrepreneurial thing that they did together. It wasn't even so much the business aspect. It was simply being able to work together on this project and that was what kind of started their real partnership together. Now, the phone company was not sitting idly by during this time. Um, they had figured out that, well, we've got this problem, right? We know that our network is vulnerable. But again, putting yourself in the shoes of a phone company executive, it might cost you a couple billion dollars to go out and replace your network, right, to, to, to fix this problem. So do you do that? Maybe. It sort of depends on how big that problem is. So what the phone company did was they developed a toll fraud surveillance system, which they called GreenStar. It was an internal code name. And what it did was it was six different machines. They were pretty big machines. They were installed in these 4A toll crossbars. They moved them around the United States. And what they basically did is they were shadow machines that would listen on the network and listen for when these tones occurred when they shouldn't be there. And they would, um, when they found evidence of what they thought was fraud, these machines would do something really interesting, which is they would tape record the entire phone call. During, from 1964 to 1970, when GreenStar was in operation, the phone company, uh, I want to get the statistics right, they randomly intercepted 33 million phone calls, and they actually tape recorded one and a half million of them, and listened to those tapes by ear um, to determine whether fraud was occurring or not. And this gave them the information that, well, let's get, this did two things, it turns out. One is, um, it gave them the information that, well, this problem is widespread, but it's not so widespread that we have to embark on a crash program to re-engineer our network immediately. Um, so we can take our time. We can kind of slowly upgrade the network. We don't have to go out tomorrow and spend a billion dollars in capital to, to re-engineer the network. The second thing it did was it gave them great insight as to who the, uh, who the layoff bookmakers were, right? Because they're now basically surveilling all these American phone calls. So, wow, not only does this phone call sound illegal in terms of it being a free phone call, it sounds like gambling. We'll be handling that, handing that over to the Justice Department, right? And there was a great quote from the AT&T attorney I interviewed with this. He said, uh, he said, yeah, you know, the Justice Department really liked us because we would show up with these tape recordings with a ribbon around them, figuratively. And he said, as he put it, uh, all of the hard work had been done and only glory lay ahead, right? You know, so. Um, so what happened on this was slowly over time, starting in the mid-1970s, the phone company began moving to a digital network, uh, which was using out-of-band signaling. So the tones were no longer being used on the same voice channel, um, but were being done over a separate digital network, which moved at a blinding 2,400 bits per second. Um, and that was how call information was routed. And so that was started to spell the end of analog era phone freaking. But there was another thing which was, which was much more of a death knell to phone freaking, which was around the mid-1970s, personal computers started showing up. And the personal computers were the thing that were, if you were somebody who was going to have been a phone freak in the 1960s, by the 1970s, you had these new toys to play with, right? You could write code. And the thing which was best about these is that, well, one, they were super interesting. But two is it was actually legal to hack on these, right? You know, the FBI isn't going to necessarily be, you know, knocking on your door because you're writing code for, for an 8-bit microprocessor, perhaps. Um, so that was, that was sort of where the, the kind of the closing arc of, of at least analog era phone freaking um, came from. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time and just talk to you about what I think are some of the lessons that we can learn from this. Um, here's the first lesson. If you build it, they will hack it. Um, it. Whatever system you were thinking about fielding, somebody is going to start hacking on it. We know this. We really truly know this in, in our heart of hearts. And yet, oddly enough, we don't, we don't always think about it too much, right? Yeah, you know, we deploy the system, and yeah, we know it has some security holes in it, but whatever, no one's really going to poke at it. Except, of course, we know someone is going to poke at it, right? That's what we all do in this audience is poke at things. So, you know, the first lesson is anything you're building is going to get hacked on. 
The second thing is the hackers aren't always going to be just curious kids. And this is, an, again, another lesson that we know. Um, you see it in the phone freak context in the form of uh, organized crime. Like, hey, here's this technology that we can use to make free phone calls, and we'll use that to aid organized crime. You obviously see it today, both in terms of, of uh, electronic crime and also in terms of, uh, of state-level actors, right? Um, you know, you see, you see the whole terrorism business and also, uh, you know, uh, NSA or China or any other kind of state-level state actor. Um, so the hackers are not just going to be as curious kids. We're long past the day that that might have been true, if it ever was true. And so that makes that first lesson, if you build it, they're going to hack it, all the more important. Right? So you really have to keep in mind, whatever you're putting out there, someone, someone who is not friendly is going to be doing something not curious with it. Lesson number three. You can forgive Bell Laboratories for not thinking about security in the 1930s. You can't forgive us, right? When AT&T first started building this network in the 1930s and 1940s, there weren't networks to hack on, so you didn't think about network hackers, right? So this is why I say you can forgive them. We know better. We know that every time we build something, someone's going to be hacking on it. So we need to start thinking about security. It's a really interesting thing to me. Um, and is, I mean, everyone here, obviously, if you're at Usenix Security, you're a security-minded person. But the vast majority of people in the world who are designing systems aren't, right? They don't think about this. So they simply don't think about security. So I think one of your goals is to be, you know, one of your roles is to be essentially a security um, evangelist, right? Is to talk to your people that you know and convince them, hey, security is important and it's, you know, it's something that has to be thought about and you know, added to your products. Related to that, it's easier to design security in from the start than it is to bolt it on later, right? So you don't have to worry about retrofitting your billion dollar network if you actually thought about security from, from the beginning. And if you designed an upgradable network, it's even better so you can address security threats as they arise. Um, this, is, this is one I particularly like. Um, and I, I want to just tell you a couple quick stories about this. Engineering insiders are often the last people to know what is actually possible with the things they design. One of the problems that, so when I talked to the guys at Bell Labs, and I said, I said, come on, you guys must have known that you had this flaw in your network. And they looked at me, the Bell Labs engineers I talked to, they looked at me and with complete sincerity said, no, we had no idea. We never thought about this. And in fact, it's actually worse than that. They would have conversations with these teenage phone freaks when they, when they caught them. And they'd say, well, what were you doing? Like, tell us what you were doing. And they would explain, well, I was doing this thing. And some of it was making tones, but it turned out, sorry, let me digress even further. Um, has anyone here ever noticed that telephone numbers never start with the digits 000 through 199? Anybody ever thought about that? Right? So it turns out telephone numbers do start with 000 through 199. It's just that you can't dial them. Right. Um, it turns out there are, or really were, internal telephone company numbers that uh, would get you to various test equipment, would get you to various special operators that all started with 000 through 199. You can't dial these numbers from a normal phone, but if you have a blue box, you can dial them. And one, because a blue box basically makes you look like an operator or a switching machine. So it now gave you access to this vast array of things inside the phone company, which included things like being able to route your own calls hither and yon manually uh, and able to talk to special operators. Uh, it enabled you to, in some cases, access uh, automatic uh, wiretapping equipment. Um, if, if in the old days, I don't know if you can even do this now, but you used to be able to call the operator and say, hey, you know, I'm trying to call Kevin. His phone's busy. Could you please verify that his number's actually busy? And she could actually break into his line. Well, it turns out that there's some automated circuitry that can do that. And if you had a blue box, you could actually connect to that remotely and remotely wiretap people. Um, so the Bell Labs engineers would talk to these kids, and they'd say, what, do you, what stuff did you do? with your blue box. And the kids would say, oh, well, I do X and I do Y and I do Z. You know, I can route my own calls. I can wiretap. And the Bell Labs engineers, several of them I talked to, said, no, you can't. 
No, our, our, that's not how our network works. We designed our network. We know how it works. It, you know, I, it, this is like just exaggeration on your part. You can't really do that. No, they could. <laughs> really, they could, guys. You know, and and it's this it's this fascinating thing that we engineers are often just kind of spring loaded to disbelieve reports to the contrary whenever we you know hear oh yeah there's this vulnerability no that can't be that's just not how the thing works right so get people outside of yourself to look at things this is why you're, the quality assurance you know this is why software QA is your friend right is is proof of concepts um, I'm going to end on an uplifting point. If you think it's bad now, just wait. <laughs> um, I, Kevin uh, and I got to know each other in this, not in the 1988 version, but in the, in the more recent version through work on a project called TerraSwarm, which is an Internet of Things uh, DARPA SRC project. And you know, TerraSwarm was looking at, imagine a world in which you have maybe 10 or 15 years hence, where you have a trillion connected devices. I don't want to imagine that world. That world terrifies me, right? Because a trillion connected devices really means a trillion computers, right? They might be little tiny crappy computers, but they're computers nonetheless. They're networked together. They are controlling cyber physical things, right? They're controlling lighting. They're controlling HVAC systems. They're monitoring things. They're personal area networks. They're all this stuff. They are resource constrained. They have tiny little microprocessors. They have tiny little batteries. Well, what happens when you have resource constraints? Well, you don't worry about things you don't need to worry about, right? What's one of the first things you'd stop worrying about? Security, right? So now imagine a world where you have a trillion devices with lamentable, let's be charitable, lamentable security out there um, that are all networked together. Wow, what an awesome future. So to be a little bit more um, uplifting, I will quote Bill Murray from the movie Stripes. Talk about limitless possibilities for improvement, right? <laughs> You know, so this is great. We're all going to have jobs. Fantastic. Yay us. <laughs> so um, I'd like to take questions now. Uh, I will be the shameless commercial plug part of the talk. Uh, there will be a book signing outside at the coffee break at 1030. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to, to talk in more detail about any super detailed questions you have, but we can take questions right now. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, oh, and I forgot to know one other interesting thing about Phil. He invented Net News, correct? The I, protocol. I invented you don't the, want to I, take credit for I, that I, because I, of the security I was, problems. I was like, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. All so right. this is. Yeah, oh, exactly. Steve Bellavin's here. Yeah, no, I did cool. not invent Net News. I, I did uh, invent. Sorry. I did invent Network News Transfer Protocol. Oh, okay. I was, I was close. Of that, which had sorry, Bill. Which had no security to speak of in it, which is why. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> okay, so we have time for questions. So we've got two mics. Just uh, state your name and affiliation, please. We'll start over here. Uh, Vern Paxson, UC Berkeley. Uh, that, that was a great talk. I really enjoyed Thank that. Um, what uh, particularly caught my eye or ear was uh, the sort of mission creep associated with AT&T's trawling for these guys. I'm wondering if you want to comment a little bit more about that, because I, I thought that was sobering, how going after the freaks turns into drug busts or gambling. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. So it's, it's really interesting. The, um, I, I spent a bunch of time talking to uh, this guy um, who is the head attorney at AT&T for privacy and fraud matters, uh, and named um, uh, Bill Kaming, and it's regrettably since passed away. Uh, super, super interesting guy, super smart guy, and had almost in some ways two minds. Because on the one hand, he actually really did take very seriously the privacy of AT&T's network. And there was a tremendous feeling in the phone company in those days that it was a national resource. And that it was, it was the US national telephone network. And so the employees had a very, uh, a very cozy relationship with the government, right? It was a government-sanctioned monopoly. We, you know, in some sense, the government is our master. We want to please them. And we feel like we're doing good work. So when the FBI called one of the guys at Bell Labs, you know, when the FBI called Bell Labs and said, hey, we have this problem, Bell Labs was only too happy to help. Um, and so that mission creep you're describing is a very real thing. It was, in particular, in the case of, of the phone freak stuff, it, it was doing two things, right? One is, okay, we're helping the, the government with their, this problem they have of wanting to prosecute mobsters, but it's also very helpful to us because it gets the government to actually go after these phone freaks, which is a thorn in our side. And so it's, it's one of these things where, uh, 
you know, it's a very convenient kind of relationship. And I think, uh, I think that's the sort of thing you have to be very, very careful of and very, very skeptical of, right? And that's, I think, I think sunlight is what you really want there, but it's hard to get sunlight, especially when you have just a single company. That's why I think like these transparency reports that we now get from internet companies are, are really cool. And, and related to that, it seems um, mission creep is sort of a, a subset of what was, uh, I thought, the overarching theme of your talk, which is coevolution, and how mm -hmm. um, you know there's this uh, uh, innovation and adaptation to it. Yes. And and uh, it seems though that that coevolution was much slower than today. And I wonder yes. if that's because the dissemination of information today is so much richer and quicker. I, I think that's certainly one thing. I think also the fact that we're not operating in the computer or telecom space anymore under a monopoly, right? So, I mean, AT&T was really the kind of, you know, Stalinist central planning organization, right? Of like, you know, you have a five-year or a 10-year or a 15-year plan for how the network is going to evolve. No one has that anymore, right? It's like, what are we going to do? We got to, we got to go. Um, so yeah, the pace of innovation has dramatically increased. And so I think, you know, what, what transpired over 15 years would now transpire over the course of six months, it feels like. So. Thank you. Sure. So I'm Steve Belvin. Like, again, great talk, great thank book. You. I'd especially like to thank you for uh, putting his, so many of your references online. We oh, can lo go look at the, you know, as someone who does do history very part time, I really appreciate easy access to uh, primary source material. I just wanted to note the, uh, whole business of the FBI not being interested in being the collection agency for the phone company, same sort of thing replayed itself with cell phone cloning about 20 years ago. Oh, interesting. The uh, AT and or the cellular companies could not get law enforcement interested in what just seemed to be toll fraud, you know, just petty uh, crime for dealing with too high uh, cell phone rates until they learned and told law enforcement that it was drug dealers and other criminals were the ones cloning the phones to have something that wasn't easily traceable to them. Yep. And suddenly law enforcement got very interested. Very different rationale for why security wasn't built in properly in the, in the first place in the cell phone network when they did know better, but the result was the same. Right. Thank you. No, that's, a great, that's a great point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, just to, to build for a second on the, uh, the stuff being, you know, documents being available online. One of the things I've tried to do, if you go to explodingthephone.com, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can go to explodingthephone.com slash search.php. Uh, and if you're like one of the first people who went there, you'll immediately send me, here's a proof of concept of an injection attack on your website. Thank yeah. you. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but you can then search. And I have about 1,000 um, original historical documents. A lot of it is from Freedom of Information Act, others from other things that are all available there as PDFs that are downloadable. So, and it's actually really cool in the book um, if you're reading the book on a, on a you know, Kindle or some sort of internet connected device, you can actually click on the end notes and it'll just take you directly to the PDF, so the document is kind of neat. Hi, John Solworth. Uh, interesting talk. I was very interested in your uh, description of the triple zero to 199 prefixes. Yes. And that to me means that insiders must have had tremendous power all sorts of insights, all distributed yes. power. Yes. And so there must have been tremendous amounts of prohibitions about what they could do and concern about their activities. Can you, can you talk about what, what went on? Sure. And also maybe their, the behaviors that resulted from, from that and what they would and wouldn't do. So um, one thing which is interesting is because the phone company was such a large manual operation back in the 60s and 70s, um, it was actually the largest employer in the United States, right? It had, it had about 800,000 employees um, in, in total. Um, there was a lot of oversight. Uh, and so one thing was simply, so some of the way that you got around that abuse, although it was you know, by no means a, a perfect solution, was simply just making sure that you had lots of people seeing things. Um, so, but, but at the same time, it's funny, one of the things that the bookmakers did, for example, uh, when they were, before they really so much knew about phone freak technology like blue boxes, but they knew they wanted to get out from under the watchful eye of the FBI, they would just find long lines, long distance uh, technicians and just bribe them. Hey, would you set up a long distance call for me and then call me? So it just, you know, so it shows up under the, you know, it doesn't show up on billing, it shows up as part of like the internal switching network. But basically, you know, all of the operators had all of these kinds of powers for dialing these internal routing codes and things. It's just that for the, for the one thing, they had pretty tight control of information, 
So not everybody knew how to do it. And number two is they had, they had really uh, extensive supervision in terms of watching what people were doing. But there's certainly, there was, certainly was not just potential for abuse, but actual abuse that occurred. Okay. Well, seeing no further questions, let's thank Phil. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>